I have a guest today. Who, we feel real comfortable sitting like this because we are very often uh, on television together, sitting side by side, talking about uh, all kinds of issues. So finally, I get the chance to bring him to you so that you can get to know him like I do. Tom Smith, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Betsy. It's, it's great to finally do this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you the uh, same question I ask every cop I bring on the show. Why did you become a cop? Well, my dad was a NYPD detective in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So that's all I grew up knowing. That's all I grew up wanting to do. Uh, I would steal his shield when he got home from work and put it on my belt and chase my sisters around. Uh, you know, all that stuff and, and literally grew up around it. We talked about, you know, crime stuff all the time. I would go to the precinct with him. I'd go up to the detective squad with him as a kid. And I just loved every part of it. There wasn't a part of that police world that I ever didn't look at favorably. I, I just was so intrigued by it. And then all the TV shows I used to watch, you know, added to that with, you know, Starsky and Hutch and the rookies and SWAT, you know, and all that in the seventies and then Hill street blues just added to that fever of wanting to do that uh, as a career. And luckily I got to do it. And that was a big recruiting tool. Wasn't it back then? Oh yeah. Most likely. Definitely. And it, and it worked, worked on me, uh, you know, because it's all, you know, it, it showed the excitement of it, the camaraderie of it. Listen, there was no, you know, you can, it's a 70s show, but you watch the bond between Starsky and Hutch and the, the funny thing about it and knowing it as well as I do, that was legitimate. They weren't actors. They were really good friends. And that translated into, you know, the, the show. Yeah. I, uh, it's funny when people ask, why did you become a cop to me? I always, I always kind of flippantly say it's because I watched too much TV, you know, as a kid of the seventies. <laughs> And uh, but it but it, it's really true. And, and that's one of the many things that has changed now when we look at how cops are portrayed in uh, television, in the movies, you know, it, very often it's 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 very dark. Um, there's uh, lots of reflection of the current time. So you see, you know, a, an indication of, oh, this cop must be corrupt and, and this and that. It's it's. Uh, mm -hmm. It's often frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the, the fun part of it. And that's what TV was back then. It was fun. You know, you, you worked your day around what show you wanted to watch back then because it was fun. And now, you know, especially us at the, at the place we are in our lives, we're retiring and doing our career. You watch these shows now and you just shake your head like, oh, they're making this cop out to look like this or... You know, the system is this. And, you know, I don't watch too many anymore. I think the last, it wasn't even a cop show, but the last kind of show I watched like that was 24, you know, and, and that was it, you know, but now you can't because it's just slanted. It's portrayed in a certain way and it, it's hard to watch uh, today. So you're one of the things that you're doing now in retirement is you're kind of, you're fighting back against that false narrative. And one of the things you're doing is you have this terrific podcast. Talk about your podcast. Well, it's called Gold Shields, and I do it with my uh, former partner and sergeant, Dan Murphy. And what we do, we came up with the idea about a year and a half ago. And the the main focus of it is, is bringing attention to incredible work that men and women in law enforcement and the military and supporters of law enforcement are doing every day that no one gets to hear about. Uh, but the little difference in our show and a lot of quote unquote true crime shows is Dan and I don't talk about other people's cases. We get the people who actually did the cases, the investigations or the military operations on our show and they tell their own story, which I think is the best part of our show. Uh, because Dan and I, we made a deal that even we know why people are on the show. Obviously, we're booking them for a specific reason, but we don't get the entire story when we book them. We actually want to get surprised a little when we do the interviews of, of some of the information about how cases developed or the outcome of some, or especially the military missions. You know, so if you watch this enough, you can see 
our reactions are all legitimate reactions when we hear certain aspects of of our guest stories. And it's just been a blast. And, you know, it caught on really quick. And it, it was a little weird at first, because like, you know, Bex, when you're in law enforcement, you try not to let anyone know who you are. And then the first couple of times that we were out or we were at an event and people recognized us was a little odd, you know, asking to take pictures with us and stuff. Took a little getting used to, uh, but it's just fun. And and we try to bring something fun and different, you know, to people who love podcasts and uh, and we have a, a great time doing it. Well, and I think one of the things that I know that you do with the podcast, you know, with the ones I've listened to is you really humanize the people that you bring on in a in a way that is it's not overly emotional and this and that but it is very realistic. I you I I feel like you guys have been very deliberate about that. Yeah, you know, it, that wasn't actually the the a thought when we started the show, but then as we did very early on we always heard from our guests the emotional, mental part of what they went through. And it just was one after another, after another. And then Dan and I, you know, we talk three, four times a day. But one of the times we spoke, we said, listen, we need to focus on this a little more than we have been, you know, because it is an issue and it's something people still don't talk about. And I wish they would more and more. And we can get into that uh, later. But and we started to really bring that out because it's important to realize and and whether you like law enforcement or not, these are human beings, you know, and human beings go through every emotion possible, especially when dealing with the most traumatic events you can think of. And everyone handles it differently and everyone's outcomes are different. And we started to see that, too. So that's definitely something we focus on, uh, especially when we hear these really like amazing stories of of military missions or shootouts, you know, that that officers are involved in and even officers we've had on that have been shot and how they've been through it and uh, or just go into a crime scene. Uh, one, for instance, real quick, uh, Anthony Espada we had on and Anthony was the uh, cop who showed up in Cleveland to the three young women who were kidnapped for 10 years. Uh, yeah. And you know, that was a long time ago. And Anthony still had a tough time talking about it, you know, when we did that interview. And we knew that. So we took our time with it. But that just showed even just showing up to a scene, not getting shot, not getting in a shooting, you know, not dealing with a suicidal person on a roof and nothing like that. But showing up to a scene of, of a kidnap, of three kidnapped women and how much of an impact that took on him. And I think that's when we really realized, all right, we really need to to hook up with organizations that deal with it and speak about it more often. Yeah, that is such a great point. And that's the thing, you and I spend uh, now a lot of time in the media talking about law enforcement and law enforcement officers in various situations. And so much of it, is negative i mean since you know we can go back to 2014 then we can go back to you know mid 2020 and cops are really under attack not just physically um but politically emotionally it's a crazy time isn't it it is and it's sad you know we're we're in a position now that we we watch these videos either body cams or or just the third or fourth person you know recording cops getting in fights and it drives me nuts because cops are allowed to defend themselves. They're allowed to fight off an attack with whatever's coming at you. And you see these videos of these cops scared to get into altercations. So instead of getting in a, in a quote unquote fight and defending yourselves, it seems like they're just holding on, you know, to these bad guys, hoping they don't get hit and hoping just more cops show up. You know, when when both of us vets were were in police academies and on the street, we were told and not acting like a tough guy. And I don't mean it this way, but we were told and trained, you're not allowed to lose a fight. You can't lose a fight because now your gun, if you lose a fight, your gun is vulnerable and that bullet can end up in your head or just taken. And now there's a gun on the street that a bad guy has. So there were so many factors in that that thought process of not losing a fight. 
and you didn't. You know, we, we tried not to anyway back then. And you didn't have this specter of these DAs over your shoulder of, my God, if I defend myself and I actually knock this guy to the ground, who's going to get locked up first, me or him? And and I feel bad for these, you know, and I, and I take my situation, like the story I just told you, always wanted to be a police officer, always wanted to go into the NYPD. And that's probably a lot of, officers that are on the street today, 22, 23, 24 years old. And I feel horrible for them because they had a dream. It got fulfilled when they got into the police department. And now can I be a cop? Can I do what I always wanted to do? And that's why cops are getting hurt because they're being hesitant. Do you think we're going to see a time where departments like the NYPD, Chicago PD, LAPD, they're, they're just never going to meet their staffing requirements? Oh, I think they have a huge problem with that uh, because, listen, is every department like this? No, there are many departments in this country that are that are cop friendly and backing their officers. And those are the departments reaching out to these young cops in the NYPD going, hey, you're not happy there. We'll double your salary. We'll get you in and out of the academy quick and get you on the street and we'll have you back. And, you know, if you're single, 22 years old and you're dealing with the crap you're dealing with in, the, in New York City, And there's a department in Florida that lets you take their car home. You know, you're in 70 degree weather every day. That's hard to pass up, you know, but the overall factor of having the department and the uh, government of that state having your back and it makes your job easier because hesitation hurts. Hesitation kills. And that's why these cops are getting hurt and killed. Well, and when you and I were young cops, you know, we worried about things like, you know, maybe getting yelled at or or are we going to am I going to violate a policy and get some time off? Maybe I'll get involved in a lawsuit. Uh, Now they their number one concern is, am I going to get indicted? The very people that are supposed to partner with them, the district attorneys and state's attorneys are now the people looking at, oh, can I find something this cop did wrong so I can indict him? How, How much does that impact um, not just proactive police work, but also the mental health of those officers. Oh, my God. You know, you, you think of, like you just said, we had a certain mindset when we started and it was do your job. You know, it wasn't, oh, my God, like you just said, am I going to get locked up? These cops, I don't know how they do it. I honestly don't. You know, I've been asked sometimes, you know, would you go back on the street? I said, I would not last a tour. I wouldn't last eight hours on it. And that, again, it's not acting a certain way or violating people, but we were brought up in the job a certain way. And that's never going to come out of me. That's never going to stop. And I don't know how these kids do it because you're going to work every day. Like, like us, your number one issue back then was getting shot and killed. Mm -hmm. That was your number one thought. Don't get killed. That's it. Just don't get killed tonight. Go home. Now that's like fourth on the list. You know, which is horrible to even think of. And to put yourself in a 22, 23 year old's body of the enormity of just say the NYPD and what you have to deal with and have the number one thought every day when you're putting your uniform on is not, am I going to get shot and killed? Is there going to be a situation that's going to pop up either with me or another officer that I'm backing up or whatever, and I'm going to be in jail in a week? I mean, that is heartbreaking to think of. Yeah, it, it, it's un, it's unthinkable for especially people of our generation. So NYPD has got all the uh, all the garbage that those officers have been dealing with, you know, pr- even prior to the death of George Floyd. Then we had the death of George Floyd and, you know, you had the riots and the just the attacks and the disrespect. And uh, and and then you became a sanctuary city. Mm. Um, how is all of that? Because we all see what's happening again in New York, in Chicago, in other sanctuary cities. And, and so much of the migrant crisis is left in the hands of, of your street law enforcement to deal with. Talk about that. Yep. And they're not getting guided the right way and even what to do and how to handle them. You know, and you're getting in again, you're getting in situations where these people are resisting. And here's the thing, whether you're an immigrant, and I've said this so many times, I might have said it on the same show with you on Newsmax, Betts, that it doesn't matter if you're an illegal immigrant or you're a career criminal. They all listen to the news. 
They all know the policies. They all know that no matter what they do, yeah, they may get locked up, but they're going to be out in two hours. They all know it. So now you, you're even adding that pressure to the cops in the NYPD and you're emboldening and empowering these immigrants and just career criminals to do whatever the hell they want. But the border crisis is resonating. There's no more border states anymore. That 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 line and that statement is completely blown away. You know, you should just be, well, Texas and Arizona and maybe New Mexico, they're dealing with this and, and San Diego, you know, but it's never going to get to up north or the northeast. Well, guess what? Here it is. And it's because of these policies that crimes up, you know, children are getting uh, trafficked all over this country. We just did a show on that, which is out now with Craig Sawyer. Oh, my God. You want to talk heartbreaking, chilling sto uh, show yeah. we just did with him. Amazing. But it's all coming from the same place, you know. And then on my side, you know, I look at it on even a, a different level, you know, I after 9-11, I spent 17 years in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And the number of people on the terror watch list that are walking into this country is mind blowing. You know, we already had we always had a stat in JTTF. If 100 if 100 got stopped at the border, 200 got in. You always double it. So you look at the numbers of guys on the terror watch list that are being grabbed. Now, double that into where they are right now in this country. And the scary part of terrorism and terrorists are they have no timeline. They don't have a sense of time. Once they get in and understand something, getting into this country is their biggest obstacle. Not the plan, not the attack, getting in the country. So once they get here, they're free. They, they can hang out, get a job, do what they want and wait for that bell to ring. And then it's going to be a really dangerous situation. Do you think Americans are mentally prepared for another another 9-11-01, another Black Swan event? Absolutely not. You know, and, and here's why. Look at what's going on in this country right now of an event that happened on the other side of the world in Israel. Look at the division that's going on right now with protests and burning and burning American flags. Here's a sad reality. If 9-11 were to happen again tomorrow you'd see exactly what's going on today on the streets of these this country. You would have protests of, it's our fault, look what you did, debt to America, just what's got saying right now. And it's because of who's here, and that is so sad. But it would happen, it, you'd have exactly what's going on now on college campuses and in the streets of the city, again, if 9-11 happened again tomorrow. Do you think that we are mentally capable of the mass deportations that are going to have to happen if there's a change in administration? I think it can be done, but listen, not not obviously getting in the heads of the people who are going to set the policies up. But is there a way to do it? Absolutely. You know, again, game planning it with me and you talking on your show. The very first thing I would do, all right, put myself in in, in that situation for a minute, is you completely shut the border down. I don't care if you're on fire, you're not getting in for either 100 days or however you want to absolutely stop everyone from coming in and then implement the plans that you need to in the country to gather up the illegals. We did it. You know, we did it the first time Trump was in office. You know, ICE went out there, had their warrants and went and, and deported people in this, you know, who were here illegally. And that's how you need to do it. You have to stop the flow, go get who's here, and then figure out the best way to have a port of entry or whatever may happen at the border. So I, I have to ask you, because we only have a, a few minutes left. You, in addition to uh, all that you do now, you're also an entrepreneur. So yes. uh, spend a minute talking about a very cool product uh, <laughs> that that you're uh you're moving around. Talk about Actually it. You have it right here. It's That's called awesome. It's called Impact. And what Impact is, Danny and I developed it uh, because we saw that no one uses pepper spray. 30 years in the NYPD, I never even thought of using my pepper spray because of the effects that it had on cops, not the bad guy. So what our product does is it's a nitrogen propelled bottle and it is a targeted stream of an extreme eye irritant. So your eyes 
burn like crazy in this small little bottle and MK3 can spray you right between the eyes between 12 and 15 feet away. Now, once it takes effect, there is no cross-contamination. You can run right up on them, grab them, and none of the spray is getting on the cop. Not one bit of it. Then you get him cuffed, and all you need is a half a bottle of water to a bottle of water and pour it over his eyes, wipe it away, and he is go- he is, the solution is gone. He is back to normal. You see fine. There's no impact on your respiratory system. And there's a UV dye identifier in it. So if the person happens to get away or you're involved in a large crowd, you can identify them later. And we're getting contacted from police departments, hospitals, college campuses, uh, just women in general who who run, who jog, you know, college kids who are going through, you know, campuses at night coming home from a night class. We're getting contacted by all of them. And uh, you can go to our website. It's carryimpact.com. And you can look at all our products and order anything you want right on our website, carryimpact.com. Tom Smith, you are always such a wealth of information. Where can people <laughs> connect with you on social media? Where can they find the podcast? Okay, it's Gold Shields. And we're on every audio channel you can think of. Apple, uh, Spotted. There's, there's, there's platforms we're on. We don't even know we're on, which is a great surprise when they pop up. Uh, and it's called Gold Shields. We're also on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash at Gold Shields. And we're also on Rumble. So we have our audio shows and then the same ones on our video channels on YouTube. And we're on, you know, Instagram at the Gold Shield Show, X, Facebook, uh, the Gold Shield Show. So we're all over the place. So hit us up and we love, and our website, I'm sorry, thegoldshieldshow.com. Uh, and hit us up, give us suggestions, tell us how you like the show, subscribe, all that good stuff. Awesome. I cannot thank you for spending time with us today. And if you'd like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Are you passionate about supporting law enforcement? The National Police Association is on a mission to strengthen our communities, protect our families, and ensure justice prevails. But they need your help. Every dollar you donate makes a difference. It funds the legal defense of police officers and police agencies, supports advocacy for pro-law enforcement legislation, and funds community outreach programs and education. Imagine safer streets, stronger bonds between officers and neighborhoods, and a brighter future for all. Join us. Visit our website at nationalpolice.org to donate today.